continue. We're talking about the Lord told us there's something you need to know. And today we want to follow up on that, continue in that series. Today we want to talk about <clears throat> don't trade the promise for a proposition. <clears throat> don't trade the promise for a proposition. <clears throat> because there's so many things in the world today. Everybody's following the proposition, but nobody's holding on to the promise. Amen. And so, <clears throat> we just want to get everybody to focus on the priority. And that's the promise, because God has given us the promise of those who believe in His Son. The promise of those who believe in His Word. The promise of those who walk in His Word, and do His Word, and carry out His Word, and stay close to Him. Amen. And the thing is, the devil wants to give everybody a proposition. But the devil don't promise you nothing. <laughs> he don't promise you nothing. He just say, I'll make a deal with you. That's the way he does. I'm going to make a deal with you. If I, we're going to trade something. You give me this, and i give you that. But he don't promise that he's going to continue on through with it. Amen. Amen. So we're going to deal with that this morning. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, and uh, read verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, and then verses 1 through 13. And this is a familiar scripture to all of us, because at some point or another we've heard this story. So we've been on this earth for a while, and we've been at church or even not at church, at some point you've heard this story. Uh, because this is the story of Jesus after he had been baptized. And he's gone into the wilderness and said to be tempted by the devil. So this is the point where Jesus goes to battle with the devil in the wilderness, which is the first of many battles he would have with him. Amen? Amen. So we want to deal with that because God doesn't put anything in this word that's not going to give a benefit to us. And so the reason why he lets us see what Jesus went through is because he knows that we would have to go through the same thing. But he wants us to know that we can be victorious in what we have to face when it comes to the devil. And there's no situation where we can't come into battle with the devil and come out victorious. And the Lord just wants us to know that. And so we're going to read that and this is how that word reads. He said, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these, this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast down thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hand they shall bear thee up lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Amen? Amen. So, as you can see, the devil ain't afraid to come up to nobody. That's who he is. 
He's bold in his, in his thought. Amen. And if we look at this, I know we were talking about some things about the promise and the purpose of proposition. But if you notice, the first thing that the law wants us to know is whenever you go into a situation where you have to deal with the devil, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can't go to the devil empty. If you go to him empty, he's going to get you every time. And just like a uh, folk would say, if you pull a gun, the old West said, if you pull a gun, make sure you use it. Don't just pull it if you pull it. But when you pull it, make sure you got bullets in your gun. Because it don't do you no good to pull it and you're not having it loaded. And you notice it said he was led by the Spirit to do what he needed to do. And so whenever you're led by the Holy Spirit, God is going to give you whatever you need to fulfill your mission. And that's the thing we have to understand. Now notice, if the devil came after Jesus, he showed us the truth that will come after us. Amen? If he's going to come up against the Son of God, he surely will come up against the children of God. Amen? And the disciples of Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this, first thing we want to deal with, uh, the promise versus the pro proposition. What is it? Well, a proposition is this. It's a proposal. It's a plan. It's a scheme. It's an offer. You ever notice when, when somebody come up to you a lot of times, and, and, and you know it's something that's not right. They come up to you and say, I got a proposition for you. Well, well, why you won't come up and give me a proposition? Well, I, I got a proposition for you. That means they're going to want you to do something in exchange for something else. It's not just going to be there. Well, look, I'm going to give you this. They want to exchange something for something else. The other thing we have to understand, we talk about promise and proposition. Promise means this. It means an assurance. It means a guarantee. It means a vow. When somebody makes a promise, that's a contract. They're saying they're going to do something. They're not asking you for anything in exchange. They're just going to do something because they want to make a vow and a pledge. When a person, I'm going to promise I'm going to help you. They don't say, well, I promise I'm going to help you if you help me first. No, that's the difference. If they say, I promise I'll help you if you help me, that's not a promise, that's a proposition. It's dependent upon something else. But a promise is not dependent upon a condition of something else. It's a guarantee that something's going to be fulfilled specifically because a pledge and a vow has been made. Now, one of the most famous trade-offs as far as the promise and the proposition was Esau and Jacob. That when you first found him, a promise and a proposition came into play. You found him, one brother basically traded his promise for the proposition of something else. Now this, this is the thing that was funny about it. Esau accepted Jacob's proposal for pottage and gave up the promise of his birthright. In other words, he gave up his blessing for some beans. And so if you want to look at that, amen. Jack and the beans stuff. What happened? Jack's mother told him to go into town and take the cow and get some money because we need money. Trade the cow in because we need money. So we can survive. Trade the old cow in. See what you can get for the cow. And bring it back so we can make it. What happened? Jack going down the road with his cow. And what happened? You run into the old, what they call old, old seller. Street seller. Don't know no seller. With his little bucket in his bag. Snake oil seller. That's what they call it. Snake oil seller. Which he's going to bite you. What happened? Snake oil seller come up to little old Jack. Hey, where you going with that cow? My mama told me to take the cow to the market to see if I get something for the cow because we need to be in need. What does the snake oil seller say? Well, look. I got a proposal for it. Give me your cow, and I'll give you this meal. Now Jack said, well, what, what good is this cow going to be? Why should I give my cow a bean? Well, this bean got special power. You notice? That this bean got special, special power. If you plant this bean, you will get everything that you need. And so what does Jack do? Gives up the cow for the bean. But notice, once he got that bean and planted it, took the bean home to his mom. Mom didn't want the bean. She threw it out the window. 
It got wet, but it grew. What happened? It wasn't a trailer that grew up from the bean. It wasn't nothing but trouble. From the time Jack saw that bean to the time he climbed up the tree, everything associated with that bean was trouble. Now, the very thing that he had in the cow that would give him milk for nourishment, he traded his nourishment for food. And that's what the devil does all the time. And so, the same way Esau accepted a proposal for pottage, the devil is always sending people pottage in the hope that they will give up their promise. He wants you to give up what you have in your hand to take what he has in his hand, which is nothing. What what those those street those, what they, those street tricksters do? What is it the the, the car shop sometimes used to have a thing when they would put the bean under the pot and they say find the bean? Yeah. But before you find the bean, you got to put down something. You know? Now you got to put down money. He, he ain't got nothing now. But he's saying, well, you put down some money, and if you find the bean, if you put down five, I'll give you ten. So what happened? Oh, I got a chance to win ten dollars. This is some easy. Here we go. This is some easy money. If it was that easy, do you think he'd be on the street putting a bean under the pot and, 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 and switching them around? Why is it that he walks away with the money and you walk away empty? That same scheme all over again. Satan is in the proposition. That's what he does. <laughs> He's a prince of propositions. He, 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 he longs uh, to have propositions with people about goods and all of that. He can accomplish his plan in getting people to give up the other promises. Every proposition that the devil has is also always associated with something dealing with God. Or Jesus Christ. You notice that? He, he never gives you a proposition that basically is going to give you an offer of what he has. He always wants to give away something that's not his. So what did he tell Jesus? He said, everything you see right here is mine to give to who I want to give to. But it wasn't his in the first place. He always wants to take something that belongs to somebody else. Give a proposition to them. See that right there? I can give you that. But all you gotta do is this. He'll come right here and say, you see that fire right there? Brother, if you agree to let me be your law and God, I'll give you that plan. That's not even his plan. He does it all the time. When we look at the scriptures, the Lord showed this to us. When he dealt with Jesus, he did had three propositions. First proposition was this, he was dealt with hunger, so we call it the hunger strike. In other words, his attack. He had three modes of attack. He came, he didn't just come one time. You always say that three strikes, and you're out. Uh -oh, what do they say when the boxes hit you? So you got to hit them with a combination of punches, and then that last punch is going to take them down. First thing he did, <clears throat> Satan tried to get Jesus, and he tries to get us to trade sustenance for stone. In situation, that's what he wants us to do. Sustenance means our nourishment, our nutrition, the things that gives us food, and the things that fill us. You notice? First thing the Bible said, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Sustenance is what fills us. So he wants to give, us what, give up what fills us to replace it with nothing. You know, he always takes it, but he never gives you anything to work. He said this. He said, command the stone, he made bread. Anybody ever, ever eat rocks? What do you think would happen if you put rocks in your mouth and try to chew on rocks? And see, the devil thought thought that Jesus was so weak that he wouldn't have sense enough not to try to eat a rock and call it bread. But, but notice what he was doing because when you look at what, what that stone means, stone pertains to burdens, it pertains to, 
to evil that pertains to faltering and misery. So in other words, this is what he wants you to do. He wants all of us to believe that burden should be for breakfast. He wants us to think that we should feed on faltering for food. He wants us to make misery a meal. He wants us to need nonsense for nourishment. And he wants to serve up situations for supper. Notice everything in the world is dealt around burdens. You have people in this life that believe if they're not in trouble, they're not living. When they get up in the morning, if I, I, I expect when I get up in the morning problems to happen. If I get up in the morning, there ain't nothing wrong. And that's, the, that's their mindset. That's their mindset. And that's the mindset the devil wants everybody to have. He wants us to hunger for the thing that he knows is going to cause a problem. I know we do this, but a lot of times, girl, I've got to get home and see my soap yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my favorite show coming on at 6. What is it? How bad is it now? I'm going to be on after a while. i got to get home. <laughs> and they, what is it? If, if, I, if I don't see my show, my day just don't go right. You, you know this? All those things he's trying to get people to get caught up in. That's the first proposition. Those things he wants you to hunger for, he's going to strike you down with. The very thing he knows that you hunger for, he's going to use it against you. And try to get you to eat it and feed upon it. When you eat poison, what happens? It kills you. <laughs> and that's what he wants you to do. He wants us to eat those things and feed on those things and fill ourselves up with the things that do us harm. And that's what you see going on in the world today. The kids and the people are filling themselves with everything that causes them hurt and trouble. That's what they're feeding on. That's what they're running to. They even have young people I heard that had a scene in a movie where the young lady said, the streets are all I know. You may want to get away from it, but that's all I know. And I'm going to stay with it till I die. Yeah. Knowing that there's no good for them, but that's what they feed them. Second proposition. We want to call it the mountaintop bucket. Whenever somebody do something, you know what it's like. You're on the street, right when you got everything that you need, somebody comes up behind you and bam! You ever notice this? You never saw anybody get mugged going into the shopping center. When did they get you? When you got your hand full and you're coming out. When the last time you heard somebody say, All right, you come out there. I want everything you got. I'm going to hook you when you come out. I'm going to leave you alone going in. But you better go in there and bring yourself back out here. They watch as you go in and they see what they come out with. And the one that come out with their hand full, with the both bags, what do they do? Bam! It's even to the point now, you know what they're doing? A lot of folks, and, uh, that you watch the signs. These folks with these expensive smartphones and iPhones, you know what they're doing now? The folks that's on the street walking and talking with their phone and holding them in their hand. You got mothers coming by, taking it out of their hand as they talk on their phone. They say that's a big thing right now. You had one pawn shop that some person brought in at least 10 of them and sold them like $100 a piece. And that's what they're doing. They're going by and bugging people for their phone. So while they're doing this, they just come by and scoop it out of their hand. Mountaintop mugging. Now notice this. Satan tried to get Jesus and he tries to get us to wave our spiritual power and authority. Wave means to give it up. Whenever you always get some time, these insurance companies and these, these photographers say, well, you need to sign this wave. What you mean sign a wave? Sometimes mechanic shops do it too. A lot of them do it. Stores, a lot of people do it. Sign this wave. What you mean sign this wave? You sign that wave, you're giving up your rights and authority to go back and say, well, look, you didn't do this right. You got to do it over free and give me my money. He wants us to wave our spiritual power and authority in order to be in want of society's positions and accolades and to be in want to him. 
Notice, he don't want us to have power over him. He wants us to be under the power to him. Notice what he says, that the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the habitable world in a moment of time. In other words, in a twinkling of an eye. What do he did? He showed Jesus a snapshot. Now you take a picture of something and you show him a snapshot. That's what he did. Once he showed a snapshot, he said this, he said, To you will I give all this power and authority and that glory, in other words, all that magnificence, that excellence, the preeminence, the dignity, and the grace. For it is turned over to me. That what the devil said. He said, see this? It's been given to me. And I can give it to whoever I want to. See now, therefore, if you will do homage and worship me just once, you know it? Just once. That's what he told you. But he told you, just bow down to me one time. If you do it just one time, all that'll be yours. How many times we hear that in the world? Just try it one time. One time ain't gonna hurt you. Just once. Just once. Mountaintop looking. Many people have died for trying things one time. Basketball player, first time he tried cocaine, he died. His heart exploded. One guy they told him not to ride a motorbike. First time he rode the motorbike, he got killed. One time. That, that's all it takes. And the devil made it, oh, it, it takes more than that for you to get, no. One time. That's it. And you notice, society always tries to get people to do things. Somebody will be with you, come on, man, let's, let's go in the store. And we, we can get that, that, that. And we can get that, that TV player, we can get that DVD player. Or we can get the phone for free. What you mean? Look. It's just gonna take one, just one time, man. That's all it take. One time, we can get it. We said we can rob that bank just one time. We said got a lot of folks that try something one time, yeah. and they doing time right now. Yeah. And that time is a whole lot longer than one year. Proposition three. The pinnacle floor. And this is the one that, 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 that's important that gets us. Satan tried to get Jesus and tries to get us to leap off the religious roof. To get world recognition, but lose out on the righteous reward of God's wonderful redemption. You know what he did? After he couldn't get him to jump for the world of things. What did he take him? He said, took him to the roof. Look. Then he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the gable of the temple. So in other words, after he couldn't get him in the world mountain, on a high place on the mountain of the world, he took him at a high spot on the church. He said, this, if you are the son of God, cast yourself down from here, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to guard you and watch over you closely and carefully. And on their hand, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. In other words, he said, you want the church folk to follow you? You want them to call you a star and say, yes, he is a prophet? Jump off this building and let them see the angels picking you up and flying you in the air. And they'll follow you the rest of your life. They'll, give you every, they'll do anything you want. There's a lot of situations. Where Satan has gotten people that's in the church. The way he gets, he get them out of the church and tell them if you do these things, then you have all this recognition. Notice. There's a lot of folks on television that tell the evangelists and doing all these things. You notice what they've done? They basically jumped off the religious roof to get the people to follow them to get world recognition. They're more concerned about what the people think about them than what God thinks. 
A lot of times they'll try to say, well, we'll give you a position. Watch out. And they get that position. But for that position, you got to give up something. You wind up losing your redemption for that recognition. And think about it. When Jesus dealt with, who did he deal with? He dealt with the Pharisees. He dealt with the priests and the prophets. He dealt with the folks in the church. And so basically, it was the folks in the church who wanted Jesus to leap through all kinds of hoops to prove himself to them. Matter of fact, they said, until you do it, we're not going to recognize you. But he refused to do it because he knew if he had done that, if he had gone for word recognition, we'd be lost. The people would have recognized him, but God wouldn't have recognized him. You know, in the scriptures talking about that? In the Bible study, they were talking about God said, there are many people that say, Lord, Lord, they ain't going to get in heaven. Because they leaped off of that pinnacle to get that attention from man, and now they're not going to get a reward from the master. The Bible says, he said, they got their reward already. So they go to God and say, but Lord, you said they're going to say that. Lord, we did many wonderful things. We fed the, the poor and, and helped the sick. And we did all these wonderful things. And the Bible said, Jesus was there. Depart from me, I never knew you. So think about it. We have all these people, a lot of people in the world doing all these things, talking about what they're doing out in the world. And we're saving the children in Africa. And right now, we over in Oklahoma. Bless them. Yeah, the people in Oklahoma need help. But some of the folks in Oklahoma are not doing it to help the people. They're doing it to help themselves. Because they can be, we getting ready to go to Oklahoma. You don't have to wave a banner saying you go to Oklahoma. Just go. God's going to see you there. God's going to bless you. But if you, look, we in Oklahoma. Fine. And then you don't get the accolade that you expect to get, then you will get in. We in Oklahoma, the Lord, the Lord didn't help us do nothing. That's not what he sent you there for. So, be careful about that pinnacle floor. Because just because you're in church don't mean he won't try to get you to leap off the religious roof. Because that's what Paul said. Paul said basically, I was a religious fanatic. So much so, I persecuted the church. I was right there when they stoned Stephen. I stood by and held everybody's coat and watched them do it. For religious recognition. He said, I was a devout Pharisee. Everybody knew me. I had high recognition. Matter of fact, I had some recognition and authority. I can go to any one of the priests and the prophets, and they give me papers to hunt down the Christians. That's how much authority and pull I had. Word recognition. He had pinnacle power. That's what he had, pinnacle power. Because he wanted everybody to look at him. Basically. And when people heard Saul was coming, they ran. Yeah. Now it's funny. When he was Saul and heard he was coming, they ran. When he became Paul and said he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, he had to run. The same Paul that went to the city, they say Saul is here, and the people were running and locking their doors. Yeah. When word got out saying, well, that same Saul is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ now. And his name is Paul. People in the same place that were locked up, now they got their sticks and sticks. Let's go get it. Same one that walked in the town and had to be let down in a basket out of the window to escape with his life. You notice the difference? As long as he was part of that pinnacle ploy, he was fine. Once he wasn't part of the ploy anymore, what happened? You got to go. You got to take him down. And that's what the devil does. He ain't working for me no more. So if he ain't working for me no more, ain't no need for him. I gotta get rid of him. You know, he ain't no use to me. That's what he does. Don't let interest lead you to ignore. And that's what the devil wants to do. Simply says that Satan attempts to get people interested in ways and things of life. 
in the hope that they will ignore the word and the teachings of the Lord. You notice? That's what a battle is. It's the interest of things and the interest of things in the world is the thing that usually pulls the people away from the word. And you notice there's more and more things, world of things being put out there now to try to pull people away from the law. Everything is hooked up on new things and trends, and it's all designed to pull them away. Once it gets your attention, he wants you to start saying, what, what? And the law is talking to you, but now you, hold, hold on, Lord. It looks mighty good right here, hold on. I, I know you, God, but I'll call on you anytime. Just, just hold on. And that's the mindset. The devil, oh, you talk to God anytime you want, can't you? That's what he said, huh? You, you, you can run back to him and go, go on and do what you need to do. You got time. Oh, hold on, Lord. I'm doing this right now. I'll get back with you. Yeah. And over time, you keep saying, hold on. Yeah. Then after a while, you just say, I, I ain't got time. Because I, I, all my focus is this. You know what the world tries to tell everybody to do? Yeah. Multitask. It used to be, they used to have your, your, your daytimes. And if your daytime was worth full, and if every hour wasn't booked up, something was wrong. Oh, I got, I got, I got time, I got to fill in. I don't, I got, oh, I, oh, I got one hour. Oh, wait a minute, no, oh, that's my lunch. No, oh, no, I got an appointment, I got to put it there. And so, people got so busy trying to be busy, <laughs> they didn't have time for anything else. They couldn't go to church. They couldn't spend time with their family. Matter of fact, they were so busy, they forgot about some of the things that they had already booked in play. Yeah. And so they, what happened? They got stressed out. Don't get so interested that you ignore it as a key. They don't, don't let their interest in the world and goods cause you to ignore the word of God. Basically this. Don't get so interested in life dramas that you ignore the law's direction. There's many folk that put down reading that word because something will be on TV at that same time. And it's dramatic. It's, oh, oh, this, this is going to be exciting. Let's see what's going to happen. A lot more exciting things in the world that's in that world. Yeah. Don't get so interested in life's fun that you ignore the lost faith. Esau let go of an inheritance that he didn't have to work for, that was given to him. Simply because you know what his main interest was, his fun interest was, his hobby was hunting. That's what he liked to do. He liked to hunt. He liked to go in the wood and hunt. He spent all his days hunting. He let what he had go because of what he was interested in doing. The favor of God will guide you and direct you through life situations. Fun might go guide you through life situations. It'll get you into some situations. But it's not going to guide you through the situations. Don't get so interested in life games that you ignore God's the law's grace. A lot of times people take grace as a green light to do wrong. Well, I can do it. All I can do is tell the Lord I'm sorry. But if you're doing it but you're not sincere about it, that don't mean anything. And a lot of times it's where we get from the Mardi Gras situation when the folks say, well, they go out there Tuesday and sin as much as they can sin because we end up going get ashes on my head. What if Wednesday don't come? Look what happened to those folks in the water. They were just at a parade. They didn't see the next day. So if they were out there doing something they weren't supposed to be doing, it didn't matter what they were doing the day before. 
what they were doing right there determined where they were going. Because think about it. Judas is scared of walking with Jesus all those years. If Jesus had decided right then to take all the disciples to glory with him, he would have been one of them. But because of one act he performed, Jesus said, I've got all the ones that you gave me. I've kept them, except for one. And what did he call it? The son of perdition. Of death, of loss. And why did he become the son of perdition? Because he accepted a proposition. Because what did he, what did he ask the priest? Said, what would you give me if I turn him over to you? That's a proposition. So he gave up the promise for a proposition. But by the time you realize what you've done, and you went back to the little men to try to fix the proposition, what did they tell them what they got to do with us? Yeah. That's blood money. We don't have we don't want it. You keep it. Matter of fact, we don't even have nothing to do with you. Yeah. So, so see how quick that proposition turned into a problem. Don't get so interested in life nonsense that you ignore the law's nerve. You got some folks get so caught up in nonsense they don't need me. Mm. <laughs> I'm telling you this. Tell from experience. Know some folks, friends, like when it came time to nonsense and drinking and stuff, man, you ain't anything. No, I ain't had nothing to eat. I ain't got time to eat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Next thing you know, boom, what's wrong? Well, he ain't eating nothing in two days. He was drinking, but he ain't eating nothing. Well, they, they got the they be joking. They got vitamins in this. No, ain't no vitamins in it. They're just taking you down. Right. You ain't eating anything. Don't get so interested in life substance that you ignore the law of supply. God said he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. But you got some folks will let go of that supply reaching for something else. And that's what the devil said. The devil tried to give Jesus a little substance. Trying to get him to release, release what he had supplied. Jesus had everything that God had already given it to him. But the devil's going to try to give him a little old piece of something. A snapshot. When Jesus is standing there, what you mean? You showing me a snapshot. There's more to it than that. Because I've seen it. Matter of fact, I created it. I was there. So what you're showing me is nothing. That's peanuts. I know what the world looks like. I know what my father created. That's just a little segment in a book. That's all it is. And all, matter of fact, I can't complete the puzzle with one piece. I need them all. So you show me one piece, where the rest of them. That one piece won't do me nothing. It won't do me a bit of good. I can't do anything with it. That, that, that's like giving somebody a spark plug. <laughs> and what this thing going to do? Well, you can drive your car. Where the car? <laughs> where the lawn? I can't do nothing with this spark plug. I can't do nothing with this. Yeah, good. It'll work. It's doing everything. Nice and clean. What am I going to do with it? It's useless. Oh, best Hit the keys. Where the car? I got, I got keys in the house right now. Probably when I was a little boy. But the thing they were they were used for aren't here anymore. They, they aren't any good. They jingle, they make noise. But that's all they do. Don't be so interested in life thrills that you ignore the Lord's treasure. A lot of times folks will uh, give up what they have. That's the story of the prodigal son. The treasure that he had in his father's house. He said, give me what's mine. And what happened? He lost it all to thrills. He said, in, in, in no time he found himself in war. And that's what the devil will, wants you to do. Everything that you have that will supply your needs, that will keep you going. He wants you to give it up, but you wind up wanting. And when you're in that war, he's not there to supply anything. And once he gets you there, he's going to do this. Well, if you want it, let's make another proposition. 
Take a proposition with that. You pull that out of money. But I need help. Okay, you want that? If you want that, let's make another proposition. Every time you make a new proposition, you get lower and lower and lower. Then what happens eventually? Just pull the rug out of money. Don't go, get so interested in life, social media, <laughs> that you ignore the law of saving message. Don't love Facebook so much that you forget about the Facebook. You got folks be on Facebook. I'm going on Facebook. But they forget about the Facebook. They try to get everybody, look at me, look at me, look at me. And then when they look at you, they don't give you the response that you want. I was looking at a show, they were talking about some young girls texting and sexting and that type of thing. Putting their pictures on Facebook. And what they did, they put some young boys in a room. And they showed the pictures that they had placed on Facebook. And when they placed the pictures before the young boys, they thought by getting all these different poses and dressed in skimpy outfits and looking a certain way to try to look sexy to the young boy that that would be attractive to the young boys. They put the young boys in the room and when they showed the pictures, the young boy said, eh, she all right. But she ain't somebody I would take home with my mom. She all right. Ain't nobody I would date. Not seriously. She good to have fun with. She look like she good to have fun with. But I don't take her serious. Now this this young boys now. Teenagers. So when they saw that, they just withered down. One little girl said, Well, they don't know me. How can they say that about me? They don't know me. I said, Well, they saw what you put of yourself on Facebook. What the old boy used to say, first impression mean a lot. And so based on what they saw on Facebook, they concluded that they were little hoochies. That they were easy. That they were there for a fun time, but not somebody they want to be around for a long time. Be careful what you get interested in. What they wanted, they wanted to have to everybody else. On Facebook to say, oh, they're pretty. I like them. And then what happens? Somebody get on that, they ugly. I can't stand them. Yeah. And so now what happens? They hurt. Once the devil gets them in that position now, when somebody comes along and try to save them, give them a message to lift them up, they so hooked on what the other people said, now they feeling bad about themselves. Then what the devil says, you ain't worth it. Y'all take their life. Nobody don't want you. You got to look at all the people on Facebook that say you ain't no good, that you're not worth it. They don't even like it. Look, look at all the Facebook hits you got. Those people don't even know. And some people will just do it just for the sake of doing it. They'll write something bad simply to tell you that. And be careful. Don't be a victim of the devil's proposition. Simply says, those who are interested in earth's iniquity and who ignore heaven's instruction will inhabit hell's incarceration. You ignore God? Always remember, old preacher used to say this every time I went to revival, they would always get there. He said, if you're ashamed, don't hold me before me. I'll be ashamed. Only before my father in heaven. And that word that was stick with me every time it was saying, if you're ashamed to own me before me, I'll be ashamed to own you before my father in heaven. And he would just say that and that word would just stick with me. And I was sitting on the morning's bench and eventually God, he was preaching again, if you're ashamed to own me before me, I'll be ashamed to own you before my father in heaven. In other words, He's simply saying, God is saying, you say you don't know me down there? By chance you make it up here, I don't say I don't know you up here. Lord, you know me. I don't know how to somebody in the family that comes in and says, man, you know me? No, I don't think I recognize you. Who are you then? So just imagine God saying that. Don't give up 
and divine inheritance going after the devil's interests. That's what he does. He wants to give up what you have in hand and take it from you. And yeah, just like a child, you got your candy in your hand, and they say, let me see that. You give it up to them. And they say, thank you. What happens? <laughs> you took my candy. No, I didn't take it. And they go, I didn't take it. Uh, you gave it to them. I just asked you, say, give it You gave it to them. The devil will trick you. Devil, as the folks say. Don't let your interests on earth prevent you from entering interest in eternity. That's, that's the thing. Interest. Interest, basically. Interest. You notice how the devil will take that play on words? Think about it. Interest. So he used things that he calls interest that can impact you entering into risk. That's interesting, isn't it? But that interesting thing can cause you not to find rest in glory. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so see how you play words? He's a tricky something. Don't let your physical imagination lead to your spiritual indictment. There's things that you can do in this life they can wind up getting you arrested and locked up. That's what that means. And that literally happens. There are things that we can do in this life that can wind up getting you locked up, get you convicted and locked up and locked away. Don't do something in this life that you imagine in your mind that allows you to wind up getting spiritually locked away and put in prison, which prison is hell. You do it here, you go to prison on earth. You do it in the manner that God said you don't do it, you go to prison in hell. Don't let your earthly practices leave you in eternal pain. But the old folks say, don't go looking for trouble. It's easy enough to get in, it'll find you. <laughs> don't go looking for it. Don't let the desire for giving into temptation leave you forever dwelling in grief and tribulation. Temptation might seem like it's good at the time. But when that time is up, there's some time to be done. Yeah. Like folks say, time to pee the pipe. I played the music, and I went on money. You owe me. You got to give me something. Now, I'm not going to walk with it without getting something. Turn to Jeremiah 16. Jeremiah chapter 16. God even lets us know why it's not good for us to ignore him. And the devil knows this. That's why he tries to get us to do it. He wants us to ignore God because he knows there's a consequence when we ignore God. He wants us to take our interests away from him. He don't want us to be interested in God. He don't want God interested in us. He wants us to ignore God. Jeremiah 16, verse 9 through 13. And this is just what the law gave Jeremiah to tell the people of Israel at the time. So we know God's position doesn't change. Amen? God's word stays the same. God's not going to waffle back and forth. He's not going to waver in his position when it comes to sin and sacrifice. He stays the same. And always the same. This is what that scripture says. He says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. You notice? He keeps talking about the voice of mirth. 
All the joy that people experience when they, they are acquainted with God and stay close to God, and God is their main interest. That's what they experience. God's voice speaks joyfully before them. There's joy, there's gladness, there's happiness. He says, And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt show this people all these words, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore have the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? And what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Notice, you're ignoring God now. You're caught up in all those interests that the devil wants you to look into. And so God's getting ready to deal with it. And then he says this, Then shall thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk after every one, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land, into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers, and there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. Go out for fun, but lose your faith. So basically, you're talking about a land that you don't know, have any else in it in the head. There is no favor in hell. There is fire in hell. He said to a land that you do not know. The devil always tried to tell us what hell ain't. But he don't tell you what hell is. You know? He always tell everybody what heaven ain't. Ain't no hell. Heaven ain't all you think it is. But you never hear him say hell is better. Ask him about hell. He goes, what, you, what you mean? Hell? What about it? Ain't no hell. But why are you always talking about hell? Heaven ain't what you think it is. Heaven ain't gonna be what you think it's gonna be. How you know? You got thrown out. That's why. And he don't want you to be there. And so notice he's doing all of this to get you in a situation where God's going to cease to show his faith in your life. Turn to Jude chapter 1. It's all the way in the back. New Testament. right before Revelation. Maybe one chapter. Jude chapter. Jude chapter. If you got Revelation, one book before Revelation, you write that. Now notice what, this is what the law says in Jude chapter 1, verse 11 and 13. He says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Baal for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cain. The society we live in today is a Cain society. In other words, what is it? They believe in order for them to do better, get rid of the one that God praises and force God to have to praise you. You notice? Even again, get rid of the other one and he will have to come to you. Get rid of your competition. In the world today, get rid of your competition and they got to come to you. Get them out of the way. They can't believe once he got Abel out of the way that God will have to accept his offering. God ain't got to accept us. God is God. 
He accepts what he says he's going to accept in the way he's going to accept it. Talked about Balaam. He talked about a man going out for money, trying to curse the people of God. When God said, you can't curse those who he has blessed. Matter of fact, every time you attempt to curse those who he has blessed, God blesses them more. I was telling some sisters and brothers that before, a long time ago. When somebody, if somebody come up to you and you bless them, God, and they try to curse you and say what you ain't going to do, don't get mad and say thank you. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Because God said when they do that to you, when they come and say something against you, or try to curse you, and you bless to him, he's going to bless you even more. Every time they open their mouth against you, it's just like they throwing out to you. Every time, I'll get you. God is going to put you down. You're going to get put down. And you just say, thank you very much. Lord, Lord praise you. Because I know what the word says. Right. Matter of fact, when Jesus preached his first sermon, he said, Bless the Lord when men prosecute you and persecute you and say things falsely against you for my sake, he said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Yeah, right. So when they start talking about you, yeah. right. hold on, because God said this up in your way. Yeah, right. What did he say in Psalms that David said? He prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> Your enemy right there in the law to him. Let me, let, me, let me put this deal out here for you. Your enemy sitting there looking, and you just come running over. You just let it fall. I can't believe it. You got that don't bother you. Folks don't have no shame. I ain't no 
ashamed of it. I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of what I do. Look what they say. Wandering stars. What are all these stars facing right now? They're going from place to place. Keep going back to people, all these other people. All these situations. They stars on earth. But the Bible says, and to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for him. And you ever notice at the concerts? When you go there first, you need to be second concert. The lights are up. But when the performers come to perform, they turn the lights out. Think about it. Most world concerts, when you go to that concert, when the people first go into the stadium, to those locations, all the lights are up. But when they get ready to perform, the lights go out and it's total darkness. But there's a spotlight on them. But everybody else associated with them are in darkness. And so God is telling us, right, that everybody that's associated with these type of folks that associate with the devil and the devil's enemies, he's telling them right there, you're going to buy the darkness for them. Even if a star is in, something happens to the star on stage. You know what they do? The light that was on them, they turn it off. And everybody that's in that building is in darkness. But when we go, and I hope I had gone to a gospel concert with Lee Wiggins and all, but when they be singing, when y'all were singing Friday night, when everybody go to the church and they sing, when you sing, the lights are on. The lights are shining. Nobody's in darkness. Everybody's basking in the light. And that's what God says in the days of Revelations. He says, when the days come and all of us are in glory, so you won't need these lights. Because the light that's coming from us and the light that's coming from the land is going to light the city. But in hell, he said there will be an utter darkness forever. Amen? This is the protocol. And Jesus gave us the protocol. For putting down propositions. Simply this. Stand on the divine written promises. And step on the devil's new propositions. Yeah. When did Jesus say it's written? Get behind me. It's written. Get behind me. And he finally said you shall not. Mm -mm. In the final, the final analysis what happened? The devil thought he had Jesus the way he wanted. Yeah. Well, he always said, when God put it in, said it in God, he said, you're going to bruise his head. And he's going to bruise your head. Yeah, right. And he always talked about when the hammer came down that cap. The deacon said when the hammer came down. Yes, sir. When they put that nail in Jesus' feet. Guess whose head that nail went through? I always remember the Lord gave us a little sermon a long time ago. The devil got a mind for me. Because when that hammer came down, when it went through Jesus' feet, it pierced his head. And when you have a headache, what do you try to do? You got a migraine, what do you try to do? You do everything you can to stop that headache, to relieve that pain. And so what is he doing? He's doing everything he can. Because every time somebody accepts Jesus Christ, that pain is coming right back. It's he, that's all. And he's in the dirt. And so he's feeling pain every time. Step on it. Just step on it. Proposition, step on it. That's the thing, stand on the word. The reward for standing on the promise. James 1 and 20. Blessed is the man that endured temptation. For when he is tried, you notice he said when he's tried. 
I mean, you might try. He didn't say what you succeed, you know. He tried. But he didn't succeed. He shall receive the crown of life. Which the Lord promised to them that love him. What do you get? Oh, I shall wear a crown. When the trumpet sounds, oh, I shall wear a crown. As soon as my feet strike, as soon as my feet strike, I'm going to lay down my head of earth, I'm going to put on my robe and Lord, go shout and tell the story. I shall wear a crown. We finish up. We finish. We finish. Don't trade the promise for the proposition. You got a crown waiting on you. 